Hi, I'm Lisa Bagshaw. Welcome to Bold Leaps, the show that interviews creative, inspiring, successful people about the risks they've taken to pursue their dreams. And today's guest is internationally acclaimed filmmaker, Jennifer Abbott. Jennifer comes from a long line of highly accomplished family, including Prime Minister John Abbott, Maud Abbott, one of the first female doctors in Canada, and actor Christopher Plummer. Always a deep thinker, in university, she studied radical political thought, deep ecology, and women's studies. After briefly thinking about law school, she enrolled at Emily Carr to study filmmaking. But after a couple of years, she decided she could teach herself everything she needed to know. And that she did. She went out on her own and began producing, directing, editing, and doing sound on films, telling stories about subjects that mattered to her. Her deep-seated passion for causes, including the climate crisis, corporate greed, animal rights, homelessness, grief, and loss, fueled her internationally acclaimed film career with such award-winning films as The Corporation, which is heralded as one of Canada's best documentaries, and The Magnitude of All Things, which also received awards and high praise. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Well, thank you, and thank you for such a kind introduction. Oh, you very <laughs> well deserved. You just strike me as being this incredibly self-sacrificing, passionate, driven, talented woman who's on this mission to save the world. So I'm so happy you're here and you're just so inspiring. I think um, I'd love to start with your childhood because I always find that somebody's childhood often affects how they are in their lives. So you come from this long line of highly accomplished people what was your childhood like? Were you encouraged to have a voice in all matters of social justice and that sort of thing? Well, I had um, really quite a mainstream upbringing, I would say, uh, even though it's true, you know, uh, I have a lot of family members that have done incredible things, including Maud Abbott, who actually fought to go to, law uh, to medical school mm. as a woman. Mm. She, it was actually not allowed. Uh, when uh, she applied and she and four others fought to go to medical school. So, uh, but even though, you know, I have a, a quite a history in Canada for sure, and I'm conflicted about it, you know, in terms of the settler state um, and co colonization of the First Nations people that were here um, prior to European arrival, um, I had a very mainstream upbringing and well, my parents and my family were very encouraging and supportive and really, you know, believed in, in women having um, equality and having careers. Uh, politically, we were not necessarily on the same place of the spectrum. And so uh, I'm quite left of center. My parents and other family members, I would say, are center to even a little bit right. And so, you know, in terms of encouragement, I, I think I had to really fight to um, have the point of view that I did. And even at a very, very early age, I felt there was something not quite right about the world around me. And that was a point of, I would say, likely conflict with my family. I just felt like I wasn't being told the whole truth. And you know, my little silent protest was that in all of my school photos, I'm frowning. And I think it was just, I needed some kind of way to express and have a record of, an historical record of, you know, my um, internal dissonance. Uh, and, and I think ultimately that surfaced in my teens and, and later at university when I started to uh, become more aware about uh, so social and political and environmental issues and um, really the deep, deep injustices in the world. And, and the fact that the prosperity of, of my family and my community were really on the backs of others, including the more than human world and, and non-human animals. So that sort of summarizes those early days. Well, it's in, that's very incredible to me that um, you just had that knowing from an early age and you 
pursued it in university, and then you decided to go to Emily Carr. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to go there and pursue film? Yeah, well, I as you know, I I went to law school, as you mentioned. I thought, you know, after I got out of uh, McGill with a political science degree, it was like, okay, what am, what am I going to do with this? So I panicked a little, applied to law school, thought maybe I'll become a human rights lawyer or an animal rights lawyer, but. It became very clear to me, well, within three days, that's, not, that's as long as I lasted, that holy, the, the, you know, the, the bureaucratic detail, the, the slog of, of legal textbooks, I just could, I, you know, just, I, I just don't think that it was quite right for me. Even though I know law can be very creative, uh, it takes, you know, I would, I, I imagined many, many years before you got to the place where you could be really creative as a lawyer. So I made the decision very, very consciously. I wanted to do something socially engaged, engaged with the, the issue, philosophy um, and, and the, the politics that I cared about, uh, but also creative. And so it seemed like a bit of a no-brainer, -brain of course, film. And so I made the very conscious decision to become a filmmaker. During Emily Carr, while you're while you were there for a couple of years, you made the decision that you would do leave there and go out on your own. Yes, um, I got antsy, I think, and also I recognized within myself. You know, I'm quite good at just sitting in front of uh, technology for hours and hours and figuring it out. And in fact, I learn best that way, just through making mistakes and through experimenting. And so, you know, I did, I'm mostly self-taught as an editor, in fact, entirely. <laughs> uh, and so that's what I did. I, I, um, I was a member and I also worked at some of the artist run um, video and film cooperatives. So I had cheap access to equipment and uh, cheap access to rentals. And so I just started to teach myself and started to uh, make my own films. The first one was actually an experimental short uh, called Skinned, which, which played at New York's Muse Museum of Modern Art. Right. In, yeah, and, and it was made with David Odiambo about interracial relationships. So that was way back then. And then I started A Cow at My Table um, soon after. Well, I can't wait to talk to you more about that. We have to take a break. But when we come back, I'm going to ask Jennifer what it was like when she woke up the next day committed to being a filmmaker on her own. Stay with us. Welcome back to Bold Leaps. So we were just talking about what a gamble it was to leave Emily Carr and presumably you have committed to being a filmmaker at this point. How did you feel the next day when you woke up and you were no longer at Emily Carr? You no longer had the comfort zone? You know, honestly, it was it it was a decision where which flowed into my life. It it didn't feel that monumental. Mm. Um, like everything, I think I, I just approached it um, with a real sort of drive to to fo yeah, follow follow my bliss actually you know to quote uh, Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. right like he's um, he was very influential to me at that point in time you know people have, who are influential have shifted over the years but uh, he used to say the journey is the end mm -hmm. right and so it, it was about process it was it was just about staying true in the present moment and and um, so it it uh, it just felt good. It, it uh, I mean it, it wasn't. I don't want to paint a rosier picture than what it was because you know today as well, um, beginning filmmakers, it's it's certainly not easy. It's not even easy for established filmmakers, and there's a lot that's wrong with the system. But um, I didn't have kids. I didn't have very much financial responsibility, and I you know could just really follow my bliss, mm -hmm. follow what I believed. So you didn't feel afraid or fear of failure or anything like that? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, I didn't. I actually have an easier time releasing a film that might be like with the corporation, you know, it's been seen by millions. I have an easier time doing that than sometimes just, you know, being vulnerable one on one. So, right. I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't feel, no, I didn't feel afraid. No. Mm -hmm. 
one of the um, first films that I, I find is very insightful into you is um, A Cow on My Table, which was your first feature documentary, started in 1993. You took a lot of risks in that film. Yeah, I mean, that one, A Cow at My Table, it, the, the underlying premise was I wanted to make a film about the barriers we erect between ourselves and our prey and who are in effect our prey, you know, the billions of so-called farm animals that we consume. And so, you know, I drove across Canada uh, trying to get into slaughterhouses, knowing full well nobody would want me in there with a the camera, and that was the point. And so, you know, I got arrested at one slaughterhouse. I spent the night in jail. Um, and uh, funnily enough, a stranger, because it was in the news, a stranger uh, called me and said, I'll pay for your legal fees if you read these two books. So I said, okay, I'll read two books. <laughs> and, uh, he paid for my legal fees. But what were yeah. the two books? Oh, um, Ishmael by uh, Daniel Quinn, who I interviewed years later for another film, and Autobiography of a Yogi, funnily enough. So, Why did he want you to read those? I don't know. I think, well, they're very, um, I think they were, were very influential for him personally, and he wanted to, to sort of pass, pass it along. Yeah. So at that time where you're, where you're, and you were like sneaking under fences and getting interviews and trespassing and so what yeah. were you thinking? Were you thinking? Well, I don't want to misrepresent the situation. I, I didn't, but all that I, when I got arrested, so basically animals need to be killed on the kill floor to be used for human consumption. And if they, for some reason, die before they get there, they are put on a, what's called a dead pile outside the slaughterhouse where they're used for um, dog food and things like that. So from the outside of this fence, it was intercontinental packers in Saskatoon, I saw a dead pile with a dead cow. And, I, and so I, all I did was I crawled under that fence and I documented her body. Uh, it's in the film. <laughs> and, uh, and then immediately, uh, I was, when I came out, I was surrounded by cop cars and, and uh, I mean, uh, I was, I, I, I had the wherewithal to actually hide the tape in my glove compartment, um, but I was arrested. I was kept in jail overnight. And when I went to court the next day, the, the, the intercontinental packer said, she, I don't want you to release her until you give us the tape. She gives us the tape. And the judge said, nope, um, presumably you have nothing to hide. And I was able to go. And anyway, it didn't, I didn't have any um, following um, legal repercussions that were any egregious or anything. It wasn't a big deal. That's ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> and is that, did you just have a strong conviction that I'm meant to do this? I believe in myself to do this? Well, I was more hyperbolic than I am now back then. And I did use, I did believe in the projects so much. I, I used to say, uh, after I make this film, I, I could die. My life would have been meaningful. <laughs> As I say, somewhat hyperbolic. Uh, I wouldn't say the same thing now about any film. Um, uh, but yes, I, I did believe in it. Um, profoundly. And I, I think that one has to believe in something like that in, in every film I make. Uh, otherwise, you just never have the fortitude to hurdle all of the barriers that are put in your way, because there's always a lot of them. A lot of barriers. Absolutely, yeah. Well, especially if you're making films that uh, are not within the mainstream public discourse. And so even though um, like, I'll, uh, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll cite The Magnitude of All Things, which is, as you know, about ecological grief. And it's, you know, it's two parallel narratives tell a story about cancer and climate change. And I started that 10 years ago at a time when, when I would tell people I was making a film about ecological grief. They'd kind of, you know, what's that? Because it wasn't in this part of the world anyway. It wasn't... A, common parlance. Now it's everywhere. Uh, but in terms of barriers making a film like that, uh, you know, it's not, it's not going to be embraced by funders immediately. It, I mean, the NFB believed in it right away. I want to 
point that out. But it was very difficult to to raise the money for that film, for example. Uh, not to mention going to all the climate front lines and everything that we had to do to make it. But there's always barriers. And, and you know, like I think all of art, it's not the cultural sector is is not always the most valued in society in terms financially, especially if you're trying to make work that critiques the status quo. And, you know, I'm an anti-capitalist, so I critique capitalism. Uh, I think there's a place for markets in society. I just don't think corporations should uh, have hegemony over uh, much of our uh, body politic. So, you know, somebody with my belief systems doesn't always get embraced by uh, big corporate entities giving out money, put it that way. <laughs> and how do you, in your mind, how do you overcome that barrier? You just... Well, I don't know if I consciously do. I, I For me, um, a lot of, I feel very, uh, I feel a lot of gratitude for having found a way in a society I feel quite alienated from to find a voice, to have a voice, to express my opinion, uh, to do work that uh, I feel has integrity and is making a difference. And so there's kind of no choice. Mm. You know, I, I, don't, I don't consciously say, okay, I must do this now. It's more, it just, it almost sort of burbles up <laughs> from my interior and it, it's just the way I move through the world. So that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you have no choice. It's almost like a calling. And mm -hmm. I wanna talk more about that, but we have to take another break. Uh, but stay with us because I'm going to ask Jennifer about how life is now and what advice she has for those of us who are too afraid to pursue our dreams when we come back. Welcome back to Bold Leaps. Jennifer, tell us about what you are working on now. Well, I'm actually working on two projects. Uh, one is a virtual reality experience called The Forest That Breathes Us with uh, mm. Dr. Suzanne Sumar, the mm. rock star uh, forest ecologist. And that's a virtual reality experience from the perspective of within the forest. Mm, fascinating. And then I'm also working on a film about the remarkable Biff Naked, who I know you know. And the magical being. Yes, yeah, she really is. It's been a pure delight. Uh, so inspirational. So it's and it's quite quite fun for me too, you know, to be traveling around with uh, this musician who's who's really become like a sister to me. Uh, and uh, just so fun. Uh, so it's it's been great. And of course, she has many profound things to say as well. So it's it's I think it's going to be a great film. And when is that film coming out? Well, we're hoping about a year. So September 2024. Okay, we're, we've just in, we've just wrapped on principal photography and going into post. And was it a different experience at all working on uh, something like that versus some of your more controversial films? Absolutely. It was different. I mean, Biff is very political mm -hmm. and she's involved in a lot of social justice uh, issues, mm -hmm. which I, of course, really appreciate. Uh, so there is that angle to it still. But I think especially, you know, in these times where there's just so much so much despair, uh, you know, so much violence uh, between people to the natural world uh, to to make a film about music. Uh, is is and and also rebellious music uh, has been uh, really just a beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. It's putting something really positive mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course Biff is is so uh, you know she's the queen of of, of love and light. Really, she you really know? is. She she, is. she epitomizes love and light. She really does. Yeah, and so to be uh, to 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 get to know her and spend time with her and also her her manager uh, Peter Carroll who mm. who she's you know been with for 30 mm -hmm. years um, you know we've become very close and uh, yeah I, I think it will be a as I say a, a really insightful film uh, I can't, one for these times yeah I can't wait to see it mm -hmm. so we only have time for about two more questions the first one is what is the biggest lesson you've learned in your career? Can I answer it a little differently? Because I don't really separate my career and my life. Mm -hmm. And so one of the thing, the revelations that I've 
had as of late. As I contend with an era that I see as catastrophic in terms of the many wars that are happening and climate catastrophe and six, you know, we choose here as existential crisis. We are in a, we, we are, it's a very vertiginous time. And so, you know, I am, as other people are dealing with a lot of very difficult feelings. And my practice as of late is actually to get in touch with those difficult feelings. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's grief, and to go underneath it. And underneath it, I always find love. Why do I feel profound grief for the loss of the world as we know it? It's because I love the world so much. Why do I, why do I fear for, for the lives of, of people that I'm seeing lost in war or gun violence or gender-based violence? It's because I, I love, I love my humanity. I love those I know, but I love, I love this world. I love the beings in it, both human and non-human. So underneath all of those difficult emotions, I try and tap into what's at its foundation. And, and that's been a, a really, um, uh, a, a practice that has brought me a lot of sol solace and also just a lot of humility and grounding um, because, you know, I think the last thing one wants to do is, is uh, get too attached to your ego get too attached to self and what oneself has and just keep that bigger frame that the the world the inter the profoundly interconnected world that we're we're all part of so I, I i have various practices where i try and have that kind of a perspective that is probably the most beautiful answer to that question i have ever heard <laughs> thank you so much oh, thank and you. thank you so much for being here thank you for everything that you're doing to try to make us more aware and to feel deeper consciousness about everything. You're producing the most beautiful, provocative, informative film. So thank you so much oh, and thank, thank you for you being so here. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. That's it for another episode of Bold Leaps. Check us out on YouTube and social media for more inspiring episodes and updates. Tell us your Bold Leaps in the comments. Special thanks to Fresh Street Market. And remember, every step you take is a step toward your dreams. <laughs>